This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Rodrigo smith Zabata, John and Becky Johnston, and Chris Benetow. Coming up on DTNS, Meta shares its new mixed reality, reality headset plans. Volkswagen is launching an app store for cars. And how do we keep kids from overdoing it on TikTok? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland of the Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Shea. We are all here. We have lots of tech news to talk about. So let's get started with the quick hits. Google made Gmail client-side encryption available for Google Workspace Enterprise and education customers. It previously launched a beta test for the encryption on the web back in December. It's now rolling out to everybody, or at least uh, in the enterprise and education tiers. The feature is off by default, so your Workspace admin will have to turn it on. Once enabled, though, users will see an additional encryption option in any email compose window. OpenAI launched its premium service, ChatGPT Plus, last month. On Wednesday, it followed up with a new API that lets any business build ChatGPT into their apps, websites, products, and services. Greg Brockman, co-founder, president, and chairman of OpenAI, tells TechCrunch that Chat uh, ChatGPT's AI is powered by the same model but behind OpenAI's ChatGPT. The API is priced at 0. 0.002 cents per 1,000 tokens, or about 750 words, and includes non-chat app experiences, with Snap, Quizlet, Instacart, and Shopify as early adopters. Well, we've still got news from Mobile World Congress, like the smartphone maker Techno. They showed off the Phantom 5 Fold, a horizontal foldable that starts at $1,099. It offers a MediaTek Dimensity 9000 Plus SoC, uses AMOLED 120 hertz displays for both the main screen and the screen when it's folded, and it's rated for 200,000 folds. That's the same as Samsung's latest foldables. No word, though, on availability. Lenovo CEO Yang Qing Yang also confirmed in an interview that the new Razer is slated for this year, featuring an improved hinge design and new front cover display. In a letter to staff, new YouTube head Neil Mohan said degener generative, rather not degenerative AI tools for creators will come to them in the coming months. Now, he said that these tools could also expand storytelling, raise production value, virtually swapping outfits, creating a fantastical film setting. All sounds kind of interesting. He also said shorts will soon get a side-by-side -side layout feature to use with existing YouTube videos or shorts, similar to TikTok's duets. And YouTube TV will also get the ability to view multiple NFL Sunday ticket games all at once. Well, the decentralized social media protocol Blue Sky, that's backed by Twitter co-founder and former CEO Jack Dorsey, released an app on the iOS App Store, meant to serve as a showcase for its authenticated transfer protocol. The service remains an invite-only beta right now, so you can download it, but unless you have an invite, you can't really use it. Right now, the app is also pretty bare bones. It has a 256 character limit, may sound familiar, supports uh, uploading photos, but doesn't have other niceties like lists or even direct messages. All right, let's get into Meta's plans for the future. The Verge's Alex Heath reports that Meta shared its four-year AR and VR roadmap with thousands of employees in Meta's Reality Labs division on Tuesday, the details of which was then shared with The Verge. Maybe, you know, it might have been a... Anyway, The Verge published it. According <laughs> to the roadmap, the Quest 3 headset... This is forthcoming, codenamed Stinson, will come out later this year. So in 2023, expect a new Quest 3, claiming to be two times thinner, twice as powerful, and slightly more expensive than the Quest 2, with a Smart Guardian feature to guide users through mixed reality experiences. Basically meaning, if you're wearing it, you can see the world around you rather than being totally immersive. Meta's VP for VR, Mark Rabkin, said that the company has sold nearly 20 million Quest headsets to date and that there will be 41 new apps and games shipping for the Quest 3. I'm willing to bet Stinson is somebody's dog. 
Anyway, <laughs> beyond this year, though, the presentation included that 2024 or in 2024, Meta will ship a more accessible, quote unquote, accessible headset code name Ventura, uh, which it hopes will pack the biggest punch. Uh, we can uh, we can at the most attractive price point in the consumer VR market, they say. Uh, this would be allowed, or sorry, this would be followed by a headset code named La Jolla. La Jolla. Uh, La Jolla, <laughs> yes. for those who aren't me. Uh, way out in the future, It's California they say. town, Scott. <laughs> That's right. California town. Somebody's cat, anyway. Uh, way out in the future, uh, <laughs> aiming to provide photorealistic avatars. But don't leave out AR. They had some news there as well. Meta plans to release a second generation of its camera-equipped Ray-Ban Stories glasses this fall. And then in 2025, it plans to ship smart glasses with a viewfinder display. This would show things like uh, incoming calls, or you'd be able to use it for uh, doing some like real-time translation and that kind of stuff. And that'll have a neural interface band to support hand gestures. There's also talk of a companion smartwatch that could come out uh, at that same time to also help with a kind of gesture support. Meanwhile, it's true AR glasses will be internally launched in 2024 before a public launch in 2027, which I was shocked to find out is only four years away, actually. Oh. I mean, OK, so let's talk about this four year roadmap. Um, you know, things can change. Um, but starting with the latest uh, iteration of the Quest. So the Quest 3 headset coming out to be two times thinner than the Quest 2, twice as powerful, but slightly more expensive. My my first <laughs> question is like, OK, well, we have the Quest Pro, which is quite a bit more expensive than the Quest 2. Quest 2 is what, 400 bucks? Quest Pro is $1,500 and still, uh, you know, you have a lot of even, you know, VR enthusiasts sort of scratching their heads being like, what is the Quest Pro that expensive for? Hmm. What, you know, like, where do we think the Quest 3 needs to be? Well, it wouldn't surprise me, I, this is complete guesswork, but it wouldn't surprise me if Meta reversed the pricing on the two, keep it as a skew, but review, reverse the price back down to its two ninety nine very lucrative entry point price. Yeah, and then launch the three at the four hundred dollar mark, maybe a little bit more, but somewhere in that range. If I were them, that is what I would do because it makes sense. I don't know what costs are, so I'm not the guy to make this decision. But it seems like you need a better entry level. You had it for a while, and then and then you lost it. <laughs> so bring it back, get that price down to get on the two. Have the three be competitive with what the two price is now, and keep the pro at wherever it is for whoever that thing's for. But which is still is kind of an for? open question. I don't yeah. know still. I still don't know. Like if we could all get one, I'm sure we'd enjoy it. I'm sure it'd be a wonderful device on our heads, and we'd enjoy all the things the pro brings to our lives. I mean, but I don't listen, know who's I've, trying to buy that for fifteen hundred dollars. Still, I've got say. one at Studio Redwood um, because you know we like to try out things and. It is nicer than the Quest 2, I guess, in terms of it's more comfortable, you know, yada, yada. But then when I hear Meta saying, we're going to roll out so many new, you know, uh, uh, AR, VR experiences for the Quest 3, it's like, where where are those experiences? Why are we waiting? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and that kind of plays into something that Rapkin said, where, you know, he was saying with the Quest 2, basically, like, the early adopters really loved it, and they got a ton of engagement. Uh, but the people who bought it, you know, kind of since the price hike or over the last year or so, they're, like, quote, they're just not as into it. Uh, as the ones that were bu that bought it early. So I, mm -hmm. I do think that is a, pro you know, like like the experiences problem is something that they definitely want to address head on with the Quest 3. It's, it's interesting to think where this will fall when it comes out later this year, right? Because we have PSVR 2, not exactly the same thing because you do have to have a console for that, but a fairly expensive headset, what, like $550 right there? Yeah. So if they mm -hmm. can hit around that price point, don't need a console for it, they can say, hey, you can get this a very similar experience. They're going to say it's going to be a very similar experience for the same money sans console, so you don't have to buy that. And Scott, I think you're spot on with the Quest 2 knocking that back down to the $299 price that it started at. But that is also that was also part of the appeal, not just the fact that it was a self-contained VR headset, but it was not that $300 is no money, but it was enough that you could okay. I'll take a I'll take a lark on this technology, and it's something I've always wanted to try. And okay, that's like that's the one big Christmas present, right? You're going to buy the kids, right? When you get into that, you know, like anything more than that, I do feel like is is a much bigger ask, and probably part of uh, you know some of the problems that we've had. 
going to that Ventura headset, though, I think it's interesting they're taking like it sounds almost like the iPhone SE where they're like, we're going to have a price point that we're going to hit. We're going to jam as much as we can. You're like we'll give you all the <laughs> all the features that you might pay extra for. Hey, you're not going to have to buy the extra head strap. We'll get you the good head strap with it. We're going to put all like the value plus stuff into that. But we're going to hit, uh, you know, whatever the maybe a price difference between the two ninety nine and a five fifty or something like that. Again, I don't want to go too specific into prices because that's you know a year out and we're just speculating here at this point yeah it's also important to note here there are now many billions of dollars in the hole in this department uh and they seem to be ready to keep going like this is going to yeah. be a lost leadership for them it already has been and you could argue that they are in the lead in terms of market share and um you know availability and that sort of thing still kind of hard to get ps5s to match with your psvr 2s yeah. which just yeah. launched and there's that whole issue so I don't know. This this to me is both showing commitment to the form and also seeming a little insane <laughs> that they yeah. lost that much money and they're going to keep going. I mean, I want them to. If they've got the money to spend, do it, I guess, Meta, but it's oof, it's a lot. Well, and, and this definitely feels like a rally the troops kind of presentation because – and also stockholders, to be quite frank, because, yes, this was for internal employees, but Meta, of course, knows that what, whether it's The Verge or Engadget or the information – they have people have sources all over the place. This is going to immediately get out. And this is to also inform people that are watching the company that, hey, we, you know, we didn't name ourselves meta on a lark. We didn't the, like the Quest Pro is not just this weird thing. We have a hardware plan that we are going to hit with some pretty forward uh, reaching technology, you know, looking for true AR by 2027 uh, and, and that they're going to keep developing that space as well. I, you know, I, I definitely think this is a. Uh, a, a message to you know uh, to media to, to and to internal employees where they're going to have some rough earnings coming up right now where people are yeah. going to be saying Scott just like you are they ran mm. through money they're they're losing money in this division their ad you know revenues blah 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 this is a we have a plan here's what it is you know uh, uh, you know keep the peace or, or hold the faith or whatever expression you want to throw out there <laughs> well and the whole listen I mean you know I'm I'm a Quest fan um, have been for a couple of years now that said I think. I like what I like, and I don't really use it for more than, I don't know, two or three apps regularly at a time. And for um, uh, Mark Rabkin to say, listen, we, we've seen that early adopters like it because they're early adopters. But like people who got it for Christmas last year aren't really using it all that much. We need to figure out what, you know, what, what the play is here. Like, yeah. why do people want this? Like, it's not just some you know fun vr lurk it's like how will this help you and i think a lot of mixed reality is supposed to help all of us um but then there are you know the early adopters like me where i'm like i actually like immersive better i don't really want the mixed reality thing until i get that killer app yeah. and you know once i see it maybe i'll change my mind all right, uh, moving on to TikTok. TikTok wants kids to be safe, or at least that's what the company is thinking behind the idea with new time screen controls that they're rolling out for users that are under the age of 18, automatically setting a 60-minute daily screen time limit, after which point those users who are under 18 would have to enter a passcode from a parent or guardian that's also connected to their account to keep watching for another 30 minutes. You know, if that is what everybody decides you're supposed to do. Teens that turn off the limit and then spend over 100 minutes a day on TikTok will then be prompted to set a daily screen time limit. Yeah, and that's not all. TikTok also plans to add family paired linked or pairing linked accounts, the ability to set words and hashtags to filter out of, you know, their linked minors feed. So they're not seeing certain content. Parents can also customize screen time limits for different days of the week. So, hey, give the kids a little bit extra time on the weekends and set times to mute TikTok notifications for teens. You know, Scott, You've raised a few teens. This is kind of a broad <laughs> swath of uh, of measures here to kind of be a little bit more friendly for parents. Uh, I guess, uh, what say you? You know, kids well, get around parental controls. Is this going to work? They do. They do. Um, I'm so there's this whole thing I could go on and on about, and I'll only <laughs> briefly say it. At the end of the day, when it comes to this sort of stuff, most of it comes down to what kind of relationship do you, the parent, have with the kid? And if it's one that's open and, and communicative, then you're going to get a lot further down the road without problems. Okay, so that's aside, forgetting about that for a second, when it just comes to like just raw nuts and bolts of how to control screen time in your house and that sort of thing, 
I went through this with Vine, Snapchat, Facebook to some degree. All of that stuff was a big deal for my kids in school. And while most of the time we try to sort of communicate around it and build trust issues around it, uh, the, it is nice to have the tools. Regardless, I think parents should be given more tools to be able to say, here's what I want to do. And whether I get the kid to do it or not, or whether he's going around my back or not, at least I've got the tools there. And, you, and it just gives the parent more to work with. So I'm all for that. But one would assume that part of the reason that TikTok is doing this is because, A, and I know this as a TikTok user, they're really good at what they do. They're good yeah. at keeping you there and keeping you there for too long. Just check on me last night at about 1.30. What was I doing? <laughs> Looking at TikTok videos. So I'm part of the problem. But they're really good at it. Those algorithms are legit and they, and they work. Um, so I think that this is a good way to counter that narrative. Whether it succeeds at that or not, it doesn't so much matter as it does. It's a little bit of a PR play to say, look, we've given you some tools now. So you have more control over what your kids are doing or even what you're, what you're doing. Oh, it's a big um, one. It's a big one. For sure. I mean, and it's also, it's also them saying... Uh, hey, don't forget about all the spy accusations and all this other weird stuff. Maybe just focus focus over here on this cool thing we're giving you to have tools. So there's a little bit of PR on both sides for those guys. And uh, I mean, it's, there's no it's, denying it. As uh, you know, Scott, I know your kids are a little older. Rich, I know your kids are a little younger. I don't have any human children. But, you know, all all of these tools, I say, I mean, these aren't bad things to offer. I mean, sure, kids love to get around things, you know, and talk and code so that parents don't really know what they're doing because that's what kids do. Um, I don't think anything is wrong with this. Instagram uh, recently rolled out some similar features designed to make sure that if you're, you know, young and impressionable, you're not on the platform all day long, even though clearly that's... Uh, in the best interest of the company for you to be on the platform all day long. <laughs> yeah, so there's a little of like, okay, we're saying this, but we know you're going to do this, but we have the tools to make sure that, you know, if you're a responsible parent or guardian, you're making sure that, you know, nobody is wasting their life away on TikTok. But as you said, Scott, I mean, you know, adults do it too. Mm -hmm. well, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, th that's what the, the, the thing that's not announced is we're going to make the algorithm worse. So you want to watch less because they have no interest in doing that. Uh, and and again, like their their whole business is to create this extremely uh, en engaging or entertaining or whatever you want to call it feed of content that you can endlessly scroll through uh, till your brain melts. I, I do. The one thing that really stood out to me, though, is I do appreciate like the ability to put the notification controls in the parents hand. Cause I do think that has like an enormous pull, especially for, I, I imagine a lot of kids like don't have a lot of like notification discipline. Like I'm a, I'm like a zero notification kind of person, yeah, but I, I, but I also know that like, like I pick up someone else's phone. There's just a billion notifications. So any way to <laughs> it, like, yes, they're, they're still going to make the app. Kids like are still going to extremely want to use the app, but give them, at least less reason to make maybe want to go through that. Uh, even I could also see that have applications like, oh, I posted something and like people are making like doing stuff I don't like with other content that I've put up. Even just silencing that notifications could give if a kid's going through like a bad experience could just even give them some space from that, even though those notifications would still be there the next time they open the app like that to me feels like the biggest move there. Uh, but I, like the, the, the key is to make the algorithm worse, which is what they're they're never going to do. Right. Never well, if, if, if you're a parent, if you're a non-parent, or you have thoughts, uh, <laughs> anything that we talk about on the show, especially as it you know pertains to TikTok or anything else, you can email us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those thoughts. All right. So for the last few years, if you wanted to run third party apps on your car's infotainment system, you were using your phone with CarPlay, maybe Android Auto, or maybe you owned a Tesla, did something different altogether. But in our in car rather operating systems are increasingly gaining traction. The manufacturer is saying we're just going to build it in. We don't want you to use anything else. Android Automotive might sound like Android Auto, but rather than running off your phone, it runs on the internal car hardware. And that's what car makers increasingly want you to use, right, Rich? Yeah, uh, we've got a, a big name uh, with some more details about how they're gonna be integrating that. The Volkswagen Group, they're the world's second largest vehicle maker, so 
big deal that they announced that their new one infotainment stack will be built on Android Automotive. With that, it announced the system will support an app store. Uh, a lot of these systems that we've seen have like apps pre-installed that you can choose to hide, but this is going to have like a full third-party app store. It'll launch on select new Audi models in the US, and then they plan to also bring it to Porsche, Lamborghini, and Bentley down the road, and I imagine it will come to uh, uh, their actual VW line as well. Apps will be car optimized, and it'll include categories for things like music, video conferencing, I, okay, weather, charging, <laughs> gaming, and smart home integration. Uh, at launch, it will include apps for things like TikTok, Spotify, and Yelp, with VW specifically saying it wanted to add in-office functionalities as well in case you got too excited by TikTok, I guess. Uh, but because of those new OS underpinnings, though, uh, you know, uh, that like Android Automotive is like your whole stack, right? That's going to control your instrument, like run on your instrument cluster too and stuff. The App Store won't be coming to existing models, just uses a totally different system, so it can't come to there. But Scott, uh, are you excited uh, to be, uh, you know, installing apps uh, directly on your car? <laughs> Well, it feels like uh, we are at the cusp of perhaps a brand new uh, ecosystem of app stores and the car manufacturers are finally up to speed to the point where they can kind of do this on their own and they're not having to kind of quickly and, and abruptly add things like CarPlay and other services to their to their systems. They'll do their own thing. And there's been some of that in the past, but they're all pretty bad. Like our, my, I have a, I don't even know what it is in our in our Volkswagen, but I hate it. It's freaking awful. I think it's got Sony's name on it. I'm not even sure what, what it's called, but it's horrendous and I can't stand it. So um, <laughs> I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the diversity of these shops are going to be range from pretty good to gnarly bad. Mm -hmm. And I'd much prefer that they were unified in some way. I'm not saying I want Google and Apple to have all the fun. I don't want that necessarily, but I, I don't love the idea of this diversity of, well, if I'm going to buy a car, let's say I go buy a new EV, a big part of my decision is going to be based on that because there's a very good chance that that system is going to be highly integrated into the other very ele electronics based EV components of that mm -hmm. car. And like having an operating system on a computer, you don't want to be, you don't want to go to a store and go, well, I really like how this computer looks, but Looks like it's running PS2 from back in the <laughs> old days. Like I don't. I, that's how that's going to feel. I think a little bit. And like buying a house for good internet, I feel like I'll be buying a car for good store access. And yeah, and I, I don't mean, know. It's going to get weird before it gets better. I think with my my current Volvo, um, which supports CarPlay, which is what I use. Volvo has its own, uh, you know, navigation system. Um, and when I pull it up on my, you know, the um, the uh the center console uh screen i'm like oh god uh no carplay way better you know we got <laughs> we got google maps we got apple maps we got uh you know i'm an apple music user so there's that there's podcasts like that all makes way more sense to me but that's not what volvo wants me to do that's just what volvo was like this is how we can sell more vehicles right <laughs> so the idea that there would be some sort of proprietary, uh, you know, app system built into, I, I know we're not talking about Volvo, we're talking about v, VW um, for this particular uh, situation, but, you know, the car manufacturers want you to use their systems because it kind of keeps you in the system. It's an ecosystem, like anything else. And I just, <laughs> you know, when I read the story earlier, I was sort of like, okay, I get that. But there are all these apps that are supposed to, like, you know, surprise and delight you, like, ooh, TikTok. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, and Yelp. I mean, I guess if you were well, going somewhere, yeah. then maybe you, you know, and if you're a passenger rather than a driver, then there are all sorts of things you can do. But when it kind of got into, like, and you could also do Zoom calls, I was like, are we hanging out in our cars more than I realized? And I think some people are, right? In your Lambo, sure. you definitely want to be hanging out in your car, to be fair. So I'm taking all my Skype calls in there just for the flex. Sure. Uh, but the, the, the other thing that though, this is kind of the pendulum swinging back for the automakers because they were loath to give up any control to a, a punny consumer electronics company. I mean, I remember like Toyota and Volkswagen took for a, a really long time, Toyota specifically, of giving you any kind of uh, uh, 
integration with CarPlay, Android Auto, and stuff like that. And all of them have basically bent the knee and said, this is what consumers want. We're going to integrate other than Tesla, really, uh, and and giving you uh, you know access to that. And what they're able to do, one, it's a it, part of it is a safety consideration, right? Like these automakers do take their their mission of like, you know, uh, keeping people safe and, and having everything, uh, you know, kind of you know, driver oriented, not being too distracting, admittedly installing TikTok maybe is not the best foot forward on that front. But the other aspect of it is these are increasingly connected platforms that have connected services to them that can generate revenue for automakers. And it's essential for them to have more stuff running on the car that they can control. I don't know how, like, it, it, I don't think Volkswagen is going to be taking like a, like a uh, commission on this. I know Mercedes is kind of running their own in totally homemade in-car uh, infotainment system with an app store, with an app ecosystem. I'm sure they're going to be taking some commissions uh, uh, on that kind of stuff. So a lot of it is about control, control of, uh, uh, of data that's flowing in and out of your car that's not going to Apple or Google and stuff like that. That's another major component to this as well. And you can do the integration deeper. You can have it on more displays. It can be consistent. You don't have to hold with Apple or Google's design guidelines. Like there, there's a lot of elements of control that automakers have been uncomfortable with with Android Auto and Apple CarPlay that they're seeing away uh, and providing a benefit to consumers to make consumers say, this is actually something I might want uh, versus, you know, everyone just immediately plugging in their phone as soon as they get into any car. Well, if you happen to be sleeping in your car, which, you know, sounds like it's better than ever, um, <laughs> the Pokemon company announced its title Pokemon Sleep way back in May of 2019. And you might have been one of those people saying, what happened to that? Finally, at Monday's Pokemon Presents event, the company announced it's coming to iOS and Android later this year. Pokemon Sleep lives. The game, it's not really a game, but it's described as making you look forward to waking up in the morning and using your phone to monitor your sleep. A lot of other apps do this already. So not only can you observe Pokemon creatures and their own sleepy habitats, that's kind of part of the fun, but it'll put you in dozing, snoozing, and slumbering categories based on the data that it collects from when you're sleeping, all of which earn you various Pokemon. One unlockable sleep type is Goofy Sleep, featuring a slow poke sleeping on its back. If you also sleep on your back, maybe you'll get the Pokemon. The game runs with just the app alone. Uh, you don't need anything that, you know hardware-related, uh, but you can also use the new Pokemon Go Plus, uh, Plus service, using it to trigger going to sleep, waking up, controlling the Pokemon Go app, and uh, also has an alarm and lullabies sung by Pikachu if you really want to go all in. Oh, it's I adorable. Know. It's so adorable. I, yeah. I, I do enjoy that this is kind of like if you grew up with like the Pokemon on your on your Game Boy, you know, back in like the 90s, like you're now at the age where you probably just want a good night's sleep. Yeah. And I, I enjoy <laughs> that the Pokemon company is wrecking. I know I, I, I kind of love this because like from a gamification perspective, what is the one thing you can't avoid doing? Sleeping. You and you're probably going to check your phone as soon as you wake up. Yeah. And you're going to see that you have a new Pokemon as soon as you wake up. Like the, the cycle to me seems seems almost. It's, it's a weird beautiful. choice, though. It's a weird <laughs> choice to pick Pikachu to sing anything to anyone. Um, mm. I've I've listened to a lot of Pokemon voices over the years. Pikachu is annoying on purpose. And it's not the version you got in the movie with Ryan Reynolds. I can promise you that he is not singing <laughs> to you. It is this annoying, <laughs> freaking whatever that is. And all you got to do is go YouTube a little Pikachu sound and you'll see what I'm saying. So that's a strange choice. Other than that. Uh, I'd, I'd like this wait, as well. Wait, I mean, why I've, is it a Jigglypuff? I, I have <laughs> used, on. on iOS, I have used a variety of sleep apps over the years. I'm going to guess that um, the Pokemon app is is kind of, you know, monitoring my, you know, breathing and, um, and sounds and, you know, rolling over as much as any other sleep app would do. That is, this is good data. You know, if you care about sleep, especially if you're like, I'm not getting the greatest sleep of my life or you know i just want to you know just crunch some data and you know do that that whole thing just to add a little fun on top of it yeah you know why not yeah, why not if you're yeah, i'm telling you person, there's, a, there's a pokemon company executive that's just sitting there's like ah, oh, they gotta sleep anyway let them play you know like that's, <laughs> let's gamify it yeah give them a yeah. Pikachu. <laughs> 
Uh, well, Scott Johnson, besides not loving Pikachu's voice, uh, what else are you up to these days? <laughs> uh, boy, there's uh, so many things. In fact, speaking of video games, speaking of Pikachu, and speaking of VR, we do a lot more coverage these days on VR issues and also VR games and things that are happening in the VR space on a little show called Core. It's a video game podcast we do each and every Thursday night. You can get it wherever you get podcasts or you can watch us live. You can find details at frogpants.com slash core and get the skinny on all things video games, including virtual reality. Ooh, VR uh, coming to you on core. We mm. also have a thank you. And our thank you goes to our brand new boss, Mitchell, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Mitchell. We are on a streak on Patreon, y'all, and we are feeling pretty great about it. Um, thanks to everybody who directly supports the show. Speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. Rich is going to talk about new adventures in e-bikes, and I will not spoil The Mandalorian. I promise you that. <laughs> I will look at you very specifically, though, and that's how you'll know how I feel about it. But wow. you can catch our show, DTNS is Live, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back doing it all again tomorrow with Chris Ashley joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>